Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast to the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Joining me today on Exegetically Speaking is Dr. Dan Trier. He's the Nodler Professor of Theology at Wheaton College. Dr. Trier, great to see you. Nice to see you too, David. Yeah, it's been a long time. I look forward to the time I can come back on campus and hang out with you guys a little bit. look forward to that too. Yeah. Well, let's just begin with something real simple. Who is Dan Trier? Well, that's a big question that, you know, people write poetry about who they are, but uh, in a more mundane way, I'm beginning my 21st year of teaching at Wheaton College, Mm. and I am a PhD supervisor in our graduate programs. I also teach undergraduate Christian thought, and I'm a person who tries to interpret the Bible theologically, and right now I'm especially trying to do that in the area of Christology. So you're writing a volume on Christology for Zondervan's new series in Dogmatics, and that'll be out in a couple of years, I guess, right, after you get it done? We hope so. <laughs> yeah, we hope all of this stuff will work out. But that's exciting. I love Christology, as you know, and love to talk about Christology. Now, you're sitting in your home office right today, and I'm at the library, so if you hear construction sounds, that's because we're building a new learning center that's 33,000 square feet. So we can't do anything about that noise. We'll just move on. We'll just move on. And we'll, en- we'll enjoy the fact that we get a chance to watch it, you know, go from sort of nothing to three stories, right? Anyway, Dan, thanks. We're going to talk about Ephesians today, Ephesians 1, 1 to 14, which is a long text, and we we can't do that in seven minutes, which is our normal time thing. But there are things that we can point out that you as a theologian reading these texts find interesting. What brought me to this text is that I'm trying to interpret one major Christological text for each chapter of the book, And for each chapter, I'm trying to associate a particular biblical passage with a Christological title and with an aspect of Christ's place in what we might call salvation history. And so the book leads off with Ephesians 1, because there, I'm going to argue, we see Christ's identity as the Son of God really prominent, and we see it really prominent in relation to his eternal communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And I think that that came alive for me in a couple of distinct ways because of some of the uh, linguistic aspects in the passage. Yeah. Now, one of the things you start with in this is beginning with the grace and peace statement, right, that that you see at the beginning of a lot of Paul's letters, charisumen kai erene apateu patrasimon kai curio iesu Christu, which is translated typically grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you gather from that as a theologian, as you hear that and as you you read that? Well, in verses 1 and 2 in the greeting, and then again in verse 3, there's this very strong association of God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes even a definite article dropping out. We've got this strong association, and it seems to fit a kind of twofold pattern that we also have in a passage like John 1, 1 and 2, where on the one hand, we have personal distinction, Father and Lord Jesus Christ are distinct Mm -hmm. from each other. But on the other hand, we have some kind of inclusion of Lord Jesus Christ in the identity of God, in the identity of Yahweh, Israel's God. This is, of course, is right in your wheelhouse to talk about Old Testament Yahweh texts and the way that uh, they come over uh, into the New Testament. But here we have Lord Kurios, the Greek equivalent in the Septuagint of Yahweh, the covenant name of Israel's God, attaching to Jesus Christ while he is both distinct from and strongly associated with God the Father. And uh, apparently, according to this, the source of grace— and he's the source of shalom, Absolutely. right? Grace Absolutely. and peace. So that's just one of the many aspects. You let me let me go down here. For those who don't know, it's a long sort of run-on sentence from verse three to fourteen in the Greek. 
a lot of people probably have made a good bit of that. But it does just sort of almost flow like a, a liturgical piece that is constructed with refrains and with things that are yes. repeated, right? So, But there's a Trinitarian structure, too, it seems like. It's striking that we see in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, and then in verse 10, for the praise, of, or verse 12, sorry, for the praise of his glory, and then again in verse 14, to the praise of his glory. And this seems to break up the text in terms of a focus on God the Father and his gracious electing work, his choosing to be for us in Christ, down through verse 6, then a focus on the beloved Son, through whom we receive this redemptive grace and all its benefits, mm. down through verse 12, and in the Holy Spirit as the presence of God who uh, makes this applied to our lives and makes a down payment, uh, as it were, of our future inheritance in verses 13 and 14. So the threefold structure seems really to be Trinitarian or proto-Trinitarian in terms yeah. of how we think about the salvation that we receive from this gracious God. I mean, it's not a fully worked out Trinitarian theology, but boy, it sure is the raw materials, isn't it? What later happens. And it just seems happens. so deliberate with that repeated vocabulary. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things, too, that I love about the sort of the notes you sent me is this connection that this passage has this rich communion. You describe it as filial communion. But it's not so much between father and son, because the title son doesn't really appear in this text, right? It's between father and Lord. I think this is a case where we learn that exegesis is more than counting word usage. We, <laughs> right? Yeah. We want to pay attention to all of the details, but sometimes a theme can be a powerful aspect of a message, even if it's not repeated with verbal frequency. And so here I would say that with the, the naming of the beloved in verse 5, the adoption theme, all of the in Christ language, which is uh, here at least 11 times, we have this powerful theme of our communion with God as Father in and through the Son, who is son by nature, and we become adopted as children by grace, we have this powerful theme, even though we don't have the name son screaming at us, the theme is screaming at us through right. the way the passage communicates. And there's just this very close connection between God and the Lord Jesus, the Son of God here, and, and our connection to that, as you say, is through adoption. This is not natural. It's not our natural state, is it? That's right. We are, we are loved so much that we are uh, brought in, even in that irregular but incredibly gracious way. Dr. Dan Trier, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. My privilege. Thanks to Ian Rosine, Rebecca Larson, and Silvio Vasquez, who helped us produce this podcast. Thanks as well to John Alonzma, our Wheaton-based director, who makes this podcast possible. We're grateful to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, then you need to consider Wheaton College. Whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, we have amazing programs, a first-rate faculty, and some of the best students in the world. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for modern and classical languages. Get started today. If you have questions about this or any of our podcast, we'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions or questions about any passage in the Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament, send us an email and we'll see if we can get one of our experts to weigh in on that for you. Our email is exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening.